Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome DARPA neurologist Jeff Ling. Uh, thank you, Kina, for that really stirring tribute. And thank you also to our five friends for sharing very personal experiences on what uh, their experiences were after, of course, the 9-11 tragedy. I think everybody in this room, everybody, knows exactly where they were and what we were doing on that day, and subsequently, how it affected each of our lives. One of the things that came through, I think in all the stories was, we came together as a community. I don't think anybody in this room sought to exact revenge on anybody. Instead, we looked to say, how can we come together as a community to make the world a better place? I'm going to share with you a story of one of my patients. So um, when I was a, I'm an army doctor, or was an army doctor, there was a patient that was brought into the triage area. His uh, unit had been ambushed in um, East Baghdad. And he was blown out of the cupola of his Humvee and landed on his back. And so I went to see him in the triage area. And he had a broken back. He had a fracture uh, at T3 and T4, non-displaced. And so I went and I looked at him. And he was able to move his hands and his feet. He was fine, no spinal cord injury. So I said to him, Mr. Trooper, I got uh, good news for you. You have a million dollar wound. That's a wound that you will recover fully from, but it's severe enough to get you out of the war. All I got to do is put you in this plastic cast for a couple of weeks and you'll be right as rain. And he starts to cry. He starts to cry. And I said, no, you don't understand. You will recover fully from this wound. And he grabs my jacket and he says, Colonel, that's not it. Do not send me home. I said, why? You have a truly honorable wound. You're injured in direct contact with the enemy. You're a hero. You're an American hero. They're going to give you a Purple Heart. You are a hero. You have nothing to be ashamed of. He said, that's not it. He said, do you know what I am when I go home? He said, what are you? He said, I'm an assistant manager of a fast food restaurant. But here, I get to help these people build a new country of their own. He is you, and you are him. If you were sent to Iraq or Afghanistan, why would you go? What would you do? You do exactly what he's doing. You're not there to rape a culture, not to steal a country's resources. You're there to do what he's doing, what all of our service members are doing, which is to help them and the world build a better community. That's what we're about. That's what America is about. That's what every one of you is about. If your children went or your friends went, that's why they would go. And so the point that I'm trying to bring here is, is that each of us were profoundly affected by 9-11, much as our five friends were. And yes, most of us did not go directly into Afghanistan and Iraq. That wasn't our skill set. That wasn't what we were supposed to do. Instead, we're supposed to use the skills that we have, that you have, to build a better community, both at home, within our nation, and of course, worldwide. Because when we build that better community, we make the world safe, not just for ourselves, but for everybody. So as we move forward into the next group, I want to introduce to you three remarkable Americans who are doing just that. They're using their unique, very special gifts to, in fact, to explore science to do what you do, which is to make the world a better place. So please allow me to introduce Dr. Lucianne Walk uh, Walkowitz. Dr. Walkowitz is an astronomer at the Adler Planetarium. She's an educator, an artist, and a true uh, technological pioneer. Allow me next to introduce Dr. Mark Norell. Dr. Norell is a biologist, paleontologist, and um, is, in fact, the department chairman of paleontology at New York City's American Museum of Natural History. And finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeff Gore. Dr. Gore is a physicist, evolutionary biologist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and has really done some pioneering work looking at how communities both thrive and subsequently collapse. So with these three remarkable uh, scientists doing the work of creating a new community, much like you are, 
We're going to start the next panel. So in this session, what we're going to do is I'm going to, get, allow, I'm going to pose a question. I'm going to allow each of two of the panelists to speak. And then I'm going to have a third one, the third one make a comment. Um, if any of you have questions, I please ask you to use your app to go ahead and uh, ask that question, because there will be a Q&A session afterwards where you can stand up and use a microphone, but also we're going to take some of those questions that we get off the app uh, so the panelists can answer them, OK? So the first question we're going to ask in uh, all of our panelists is, in this time when so many conversations are focused on big data in biology, I'd like them to actually discuss their experiences with sparse data. So Lucianne, please start. Sure. You know, I think we're at a really interesting point in astronomy and in astrobiology in particular, in which we're entering into the era of big data, but at the same time, the information that we gather is actually rather sparse. So what do I mean by that? Well, at this point, we no longer are that vision that you probably have of an astronomer where we're staring through a telescope at a single object during the course of the night. Nowadays, what we do in my field is we build largely robotic, large survey telescopes, or space telescopes even, that are designed to observe a large number of objects at any given time. And examples of this are NASA's Kepler mission, which I've worked on since it, before it launched, and also the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is currently being constructed in Chile. Now take the search for life in the universe as an example. NASA's Kepler mission has discovered literally thousands of planets worlds that are small and rocky like our own planet. But at the same time, what we do to discover those planets is we look for the tiny dimming of light from the star that we observe that allows us to infer that the planet is there. The planets themselves are billions of times dimmer than the star, and so actually the search for planets is really the observations of stars themselves. Now what that tells us is how far the planet is from the star and how large the planet is. And from that, every time you see a headline that says, we've discovered the most habitable planet ever known, <laughs> what you can infer is that what we really know is the amount of light that it receives from its parent star, and therefore, whether that would make it a place that we might find liquid water on the surface, and also its size, which allows us to say whether it's something that's more likely to be like Earth or something that's large and gaseous like Jupiter. But in fact, that information is quite sparse when compared to the wonderful complexity that we see in the only habitable and yet also truly inhabited planet, um, the one that we're all from. So in that sense, our ability to detect and to discover not just the places for life in the universe, but actually life itself is very information limited at the moment. And that'll change to some extent in the near future, but uh, we're not quite there yet. Thank you, Lucianne. Mark? Well, somebody who works on, on fossils, I work with the least data of anything. But at the same time, because I'm really just a biologist who works on fossils instead of a geologist who works on fossils, so a lot of my lab actually works on living organisms. And you know, everybody 15 years ago, everybody thought, oh, it's going to be great when we can get these whole genome sequences and we can get all this other data and we can have computers that are fast enough to be able to analyze these data for all different sets of purposes. What really hasn't turned out that way, because we have so much data now, we have machines that are so fast that we can actually analyze this data, we just don't have any good ideas to be able to ask them what to do with it. I mean, just annotating a single, a single you know, genome is a big thing. Just trying to align some of these sequences is a big thing. And then if you're trying to do the sorts of analyses that we're interested in, which are called total evidence analyses, being able to simultaneously analyze something that you might have five or six characteristics with and combine that with things that you, in the living world, that you have, you know, the petabases of in some cases, it's a, it's a really, really, really a difficult problem. So the, the sparse data thing, I think, is the same question as the big data thing. We're all trying to get a holistic picture of how these things work with each other, both to ask phylogenetic questions and then to be able to use those phylogenetic questions or phylogenetic answers to be able to make predictive statements about how evolution works, about what constraint is. It's just turning out to be a lot bigger problem than we thought that it ever would. Jeff? Uh, yeah, my, my sense is that we've, in science, we're always working in this kind of sparse data regime just because uh, if the question that we're trying to answer, there's a lot of data for it, then we quickly answer it, and then we go on to the next question where we're just kind of data limited and we're struggling. So there's a sense that uh, we're, always, we're always data limited in, in there. Uh, but in terms of the, the big data revolution that we're all talking about, I think the, to me the most interesting question that comes out of that is, 
uh, you know, the distinction between being able to solve a problem and being able to understand it. Because I think in the past, those were really one and the same thing. But now if you look at some of the, uh, some of the advances in machine learning and, and other disciplines, where, uh, where now we're developing algorithms to, for example, do image recognition, uh, deep learning approaches are actually, seem, may, they may be able to solve that problem, but at the same time, it may be that no human can actually describe how it is that the computer is solving it. Right? So we, we're in this regime where maybe the, the, the right way of solving some problems is not the traditional way that we think of as, as scientists. Uh, and from my standpoint as a physicist, this is rather sad because you know, I, I'm a scientist because I like to understand things, and uh, in some cases, that may, maybe is not the right approach. In each of your respective fields, uh, what are the uh, scientific methods and tools that, that you employ? And, uh, and what really are the limitations of those tools? So Jeff? Sure, yeah, so uh, I'm really interested in trying to understand the dyna dynamics of populations, uh, uh, populations of organisms either in the lab or uh, in nature. And uh, in, in this field, there, uh, there are many really interesting uh, evolutionary and ecological phenomena that happen as a result of interactions between individuals. And the problem is that uh, when you, if you want to talk about sparse data, okay, maybe uh, paleontology is even worse, but uh, <laughs> trying to understand uh, a natural population of zebra or so, this is, this is a real sparse data problem where if you want to try to follow the dynamics of this population, you have to send, send people out to try to count zebras over years, and you know, it's, it's a real challenge. Uh, and so what we do in my group is uh, we try to understand these dynamics, but in the laboratory. So what we do is we take say microbial populations, put them in the lab, and uh, try to understand, for example, well, what, what does a cooperative population do? What are, uh, what are the limitations? Uh, maybe these cooperative populations uh, can't, uh, can't survive the presence of cheater strategies, for example, because maybe a cheater will spread and, and limit the ability of the population to uh, engage in this cooperative behavior. And in, in this context, uh, a major challenge is just to be able to track the dynamics of these populations, the abundances of all these different species, in many different replicate populations uh, over time. And uh, we, you know, we're all familiar with the, the drop in the cost of sequencing that's occurred over the last particular five, 10 years. And this has really been, been remarkable, and it's allowed us to sequence many different organisms uh, in many different regimes. But it turns out that it's still actually rather expensive if you want to track hundreds of populations over time with many different species that uh, eventually sequencing costs really are, uh, really are prohibitive. Uh, and indeed, in many cases, it's not even the sequencing that is the most costly part of this whole endeavor. It's just preparing the sample, right? You have to pull the DNA out of the organisms and so forth. Uh, and, and in some cases, that's by far the dominant, uh, the dominant lim limiting factor in terms of our ability to track the dynamics of these populations. Uh, one thing that I think is, is kind of fascinating in if you're trying to compare the, uh, what we understand about zebra populations as compared to what we understand about bacteria in the soil is that, uh, in, in general, uh, we've known much, you know, I, I said, oh, understanding zebras is very hard, but at least you can see them, right? <laughs> Whereas, you know, the, the bacteria that are in the soil, uh, it's, they've been basically a total mystery uh, in that you, know, you can always scoop out and look at them in the microscope, but it turns out that if you look at these bacteria in the microscope, they all look identical, right? They just look like little rods, just like E. coli that you might have seen in a microscope. And so even though these might be amazingly complex, rich communities, this is, you know, they all look the same, even with, even with a nice microscope. Uh, but now, with, again, with, with sequencing, we're starting to get a handle on, uh, on you know, what's, what's out there when we look in, you know, in the soil, in the ocean, and so forth. Okay, thank you. Lucianne? You know, at least you're on the same planet as the <laughs> thing you're trying to <laughs> No, for us, you know, I think it's, um, it's interesting because uh, people often think that there needs to be some sort of gigantic technological breakthrough um, in order to be able to discover life in the universe. And methodologically, a lot of what we do in astronomy is actually quite similar to what we've always done. You know, telescopes, the technology has improved, but it hasn't changed that much. And so, to a certain extent, our ability to actually detect life in the universe is a matter of how we deploy our resources. The ability to find life on another planet essentially comes down to looking for what we call biomarkers. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Biomarkers are not a, a single signature, but a collection of the measurement of um, what molecules are present in a planetary atmosphere. And not just which ones are present, but what the particular balance is of that that would indicate that life is influencing chemistry in that planetary system. Now this is difficult to do, of course, because these planets are many, many light years away. And we're really limited in terms of our signal. We often use the light from the star itself shining through the atmosphere of the planet as it comes to us 
to get that chemical fingerprint of what the planetary atmosphere is made of. We've only been able to do this for a couple of planets so far. Now, when the James Webb Space Telescope launches, which is the infrared successor to Hubble, um, which will launch over the next couple of years, we'll be able to do this for another several planets. And that will be our ability to figure out what these planets are actually made up of, whether they resemble more like Earth or more like Venus, which is a very not habitable place as we understand it. But the catch is, is that we get down to where we'll still only have a very small sample. And in astrobiology and the detection of life, more is actually more than more. So if you only have an example of a, a couple, of a sample of just a few, then you don't really know what normal is. And what I think will happen is that we will have detected signs of life in the universe long before we agree on whether we've detected signs of life in the universe, just because of the fact that we'd only have one example of an inhabited world. And therefore, everything that we look for is very tuned towards what we see life doing here on Earth. And life does influence the atmosphere, but um, is that typical? We don't know. And so I think that uh, we'll, we'll be in the presence of knowing that there is life in the universe before we know that we know. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> yeah, I think that you know, everything that you know, my work is based on is just a, the simple assumption that life is a singular history. So going from that, then we can employ lots of different tools. And I think that the big need for you know, the next generation of tools are largely theoretical ones as opposed to practical ones. Uh, and I say that just because is that, you know, as paleontologists, we're pretty down on the technology food chain. Uh, we don't get a lot, but you know, in the last few years, it's been great because all these synchrotrons have been sort of reutilized because physicists just don't use them anymore, that they're all on to Large Hadron Collider and everything. So there's ones that we can use to both do tomography at the uh, submicron scale as well as do mass spectrometry. And so we've been you know, doing these experiments trying to figure out what color dinosaurs were with, with some of that work. And it's, it's just been really fascinating how we can sort of make use of a lot of these old tools. And I was just speaking with Jeff about this a little bit last night and this morning, is the, mo the most recent application of some of this is using some of the phylogenetic tools and the biogeographic tools that uh, theoretically we've constructed over the last 30 years to look at metastasizing tumors in pancreatic cancer. Because if you think of it, it's a biogeographic problem. You have a single cell that, meta that uh, starts developing. It forms a tumor, and then it becomes metastasized. And you can look at each one of those as either a speciation event or as a dispersal event from a single center. And I think it's pretty interesting of how some of the things that we've developed to be able to originally look at you know, dinosaurs and beetles and that kind of thing can be applied to things that I never thought they would be able be applied to when we were first coming up with this stuff. So um, in each of your disciplines, evolution plays a critical role. So what are your thoughts on the repeatability, but really the predictability of evolution? Mark? Well, I think that looking at you know, evolution in general, I mean, evolution is repeatable. It's just not repeatable in a predictable way. Uh, that there's a lot of great cases of what's called convergent evolution that exist all the way from molecular machinery to that sna snakes re-evolve legs. And the legs that they re-evolve look identical to the legs of the, what people would traditionally call a wizard. And the issue with it a little bit also is further confused because that there's this idea of whether these are independent samples or not. Because life has a singular history, everything's evolved from a single thing that there's a lot of just you know, overlap in developmental machinery and everything else. And I think really where we're going next is to try to understand some of these processes. One of the big ones is development itself. I mean, how can something, you know, lose something as complex as hind limbs and forelimbs for several million years and then re-evolve that exact same structure that's identical to it? So you know, we would say that in a traditional sense, we would say that those aren't even homologous to one another or it's type one just observed homology because that these legged things that uh, are descended from a, uh, from a limbless common ancestor, but what they get back is identical. We see the same thing with, at the molecular level as well, where the, there's preferential nucleotide substitutions that occur in the same places over and over and over again. We also see a lot of just constraint as well. I mean, that there's certain both nucleotide substitutions, proteins, and you know, other structures that never change at all. I mean, like why haven't vertebrates, that they've lost legs, they've re-evolved legs, why have we never evolved six appendages as opposed to four? So that there's things that are so deeply canalized within either developmental systems or genetic systems that uh, we can't really, we don't really understand what's going on yet. But I think that the big clue to this is going to be both interfacing development morphology with 
molecular biology and understanding this in a phylogenetic context. And there's really a lot to do out there, but I think with some of the modern techniques and some better ideas, we'll be able to get a handle on some of this stuff. So the short answer is yes, uh, evolution is repeatable. It's repeated itself over and over and over, time after time after time. Is it predictable? So far, we can't tell. Jeff. Yeah, I think that when, when we're trying to figure out something like the repeatability of evolution, it's useful to look at uh, kind of different length scales and different time scales, right? So on the one hand, if you want to try to understand uh, what happens over short time scales, it's possible to study this in the context of the laboratory, right? So you can take a population of bacteria that start out identical, right? And then what you can do is you can take 100 of these and place them in the same challenging environment. So this could be an antibiotic challenge, or it could be uh, high temperatures or whatnot. And then you can just ask, you know, how similar are the evolutionary trajectories over these 100 different populations? Uh, and I mean, as, as Mark was saying, in many cases, uh, there, there is striking reproducibility in these different evolutionary trajectories, in the sense that you can take these 100 populations, you can sequence them over time, you can see that there are a fair number of different uh, mutations that either hit the same gene or in some cases even the exact same mutation and the same gene occurs in these replicate populations. And that, that's rather direct, strong evidence for the reproducibility of evolution uh, of a particular population in uh, a particular challenge. But then, of course, if you want to try to understand something about the reproducibility of evolution over longer time scales, that is, uh, that's challenging. And there we, we really do have to take the approach of the, the historical approach where we look to say, well, you know, how many times has, uh, have eyes evolved? And I think that this is a context in which, uh, well, we, we, we know that there are dozens and dozens of cases in which uh, these complex image-forming eyes have evolved. Right? So in, in that sense, it appears that it's not such a difficult structure to evolve, that it's something that is just very useful, given that we can collect a lot of information uh, if, we, uh, if we acquire these eyes. And given that, evolution finds a number of different ways of, uh, of evolving, uh, evolving these structures. However, I think that for many of us, when we are thinking about uh, this question of you know, how predictable uh, is evolution, what we really want to, what we're really trying to ask is, big picture, life on Earth. Uh, if you had restarted the the Earth and you had maybe a hundred Earths 4.5 billion years ago, and you just could replay all of them, it, what we really want to know is, you know, how how many of those Earths would have evolved life at all? You know, how many of them would have evolved? Yeah. You know, I don't know, eukaryotic life, where the, where the nucleus is separated, or, or multicellular life, or intelligent life. I mean, so it, for, for many of us, what, we are, what we're really curious about is, is these big picture things. And, and there, that's a really sparse problem. Right? Not only do we only have one Earth, but we have an extreme uh, observer bias, which is that we're here arguing about this, which means that we, uh, that def, you know, this Earth definitely evolved intelligent life. Uh, and that means that it's very difficult for us to have any sense of the statistics of these various processes. And uh, it, it's in, in this kind of light that a, a, a recent, well, an essay written by Nick Bostrom back in uh, 2008 in Technology Review uh, really got me excited because he, his uh, sort of tagline, he said, oh, he hopes that we don't find uh, life on Mars. Right? And, uh, you know, and this is, as a scientist, this is crazy, right? Because, you know, all of us, this would be the best thing ever. If we found life that evolved independently on Mars, it would, you know, this would, you know, this would make our decade, right? And, uh, you know, but, but Bostrom has an argument that, that really uh, I'd never heard of and really uh, kind of got me thinking and convinced me that, right, so, and it, it, it's his take on this Fermi paradox, which is the question of, given that we have, you know, 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and if you, and now we know that lots of these stars have exoplanets, a fair number of them probably have planets orbiting that are around the right temperature, the right size relative to Earth. You know, of course, many of them won't have the right atmosphere or whatnot. But if you kind of, if you make, you know, I encourage you to go home, make your own estimates of these things, and you'll, you'll likely conclude that actually our galaxy should be teeming with life. And indeed, maybe even teeming with intelligent life that is spacefaring. And, and, but if that's true, then they should have, we should be able to find some evidence for that. Right? And from this kind of argument, uh, there, there's this idea out there that there's some uh, great filter, there's some step in this process going from a lifeless planet to a spacefaring civilization, there's something that's just very, very difficult. And, and when we say very difficult, we mean really difficult, given the 100 billion stars that are out there. And the, the argument that, that Bostrom is making is that, well, this, this great filter, it could, have, it could be something that is in our past, i.e., that we already just got sufficiently lucky that we passed it, or it could be something that's in our future. And it could be, for example, that technological societies destroy themselves. Right? Now, we don't know whether it's in our past or in our future, but 
what's interesting is that if we find life on Mars or on Europa, and it's in particular life that evolved independently, then this is actually a very bad sign for us. Because if we go to Mars and we see, oh, you know, here is some independent life form, then that means that maybe evolving life is not so hard. Right? And that kind of pushes the kind of probability that maybe it's more likely that this, this great filter is ahead of us and that you know, it's bad news for our future. Right? And indeed, <laughs> uh, it, it turns out that the more interesting life form that you discover, the worse the news is for us. Right? Uh, because you know, if, if we go to Mars and we, we find you know, little green men, then that's really bad news. Because what it means is that actually it's not so hard to evolve intelligent life. And that means that it's almost certainly the case that this great filter is ahead of us. And that's, and that's bad news for humanity. Right? But I'd love to hear your guys' take on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think, uh, I think Fermi's paradox is such an interesting thought experiment um, because I think it says uh, pr possibly more about us than it does about the universe. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I am still definitely holding out hope for life on Mars. Um, there's definitely no little green men that we've, we've found so far, but still hoping for something. You know, Fermi's paradox, I think, is interesting because it says a lot about um, our inferences of how much we've looked for life in the universe. So I think one of the interesting things that we've discovered in the past couple of years of really being able to quantify prob probably how many planets there are, which is that they're incredibly common, is that we've also discovered that, in fact, most of the places that we might look for life in the universe are actually quite different from our own. These small rocky worlds that we look for when we look for an Earth-like planet, well, they are quite common. They're, in fact, the most common kind of planet that is produced by our universe, apparently. Um, however, stars like our sun are not the most common kind of star that is produced. The most common kind of star is something called a red dwarf or an M dwarf, something that's about the half the, the size of the sun and um, glows with a lot less luminosity, puts out most of its light in the infrared. Now. Uh, in order for the planet to have uh, enough energy to have pro even the possibility of there being liquid water on the surface, the planet has to reside very, very close to the star, almost like being cuddled around a campfire that's going out. Now, the thing about that is that these stars also have uh, very energetic equivalents to solar flares. So they also spatter their planet with ultraviolet and X-ray radiation. So now you have both a very uh, high energy and a very low energy regime, right? Most of the light that's around for life to use, whether it be for photosynthesis or anything else, is in the infrared, low energy photons. But you also have these periodic injections of this very high energy radiation that we think of as being very bad for life. And so on the one hand, most of, and by the numbers, by the way, those are 70% of the stars in the universe. So because Earth-sized planets occur just as commonly around those stars as they do around our own star, it means that most of the places we could even look for life are very different than our own. So on the one hand, it, it could be that um, you know, technological advancement is actually not all that advantageous for life. It could be <laughs> that there is some great filter um, that we'll be subject to and that technology uh, will help get us there. Or it could just be that the majority of the life that's available for us to even find in the universe is very different. And so, you know, I, I love to talk about um, what I call uh, hyper-intelligent space dolphins. So uh, hyper-intelligent space dolphins, we, we think that uh, life began here in little puddles, or at least in the oceans, right? And that eventually it ended up on land where it did things like build technology, build antennas, started to broadcast, started to do things like the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, what if you had a world in which uh, it was advantageous to shield yourself from the high energy injections um, from your star by residing in the water, by never crawling up on land? And so life thrives under the water. Well, you, uh, then you get back to the fact that uh, space exploration, um, exploration of one's environment is a culturally held value. It's something that I think we all share in this room but it's also something that's deeply linked to our, the fact that we can see the sky. We have a concept of astronomy. We have a concept of ourselves as a planet in space orbiting a star in space that is but one of many stars. If you would advance life where you have that life growing and thriving under the water, well, perhaps you don't actually have a concept of astronomy. Perhaps you don't have a concept of space exploration in the same way that you would for life here on Earth. And so uh, to a certain extent, this is again the problem with only having one example. 
um, that you know, our ability to study the repeatability of evolution or whether life is typically, in, whether life typically advances um, technology and builds uh, things that become spacefaring civilizations, that's something that is tied very much to uh, this one species that considers this place in the cosmos, human beings. So, so Mark, um, have you seen uh, fossilized evidence of space dolphins? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all, but I, I mean, I think that uh, you could easily imagine a world where highly intelligent life lived in subaquatic systems. I mean, it might even be better because that they'd be living in a three-dimensional world as opposed to a two-dimensional world. And certainly just the way, the way that we study the benthos and the, we also study you know, astronomical problems as well. Uh, I don't see any reason why something living under the water or what any other liquid couldn't evolve and meet those technological challenges as well. Well, we can't leave this uh, topic. So <laughs> I have to bounce it back to Jeff because he started it. All right. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it really could be the case, of course, that we, there are super intelligent dolphins out there. And, and maybe, maybe not, they, uh, they want to come visit us. But in terms of Fermi's paradox, though, it's not a question of whether there are some intelligent dolphins, dolphins but rather, are all the intelligent life out there? Are they all dolphins? And I would submit the answer is probably no. Right? That, you know, the, the, the Fermi's paradox is saying that we, ha we, ha we don't have any observation of intelligent life either transmitting or coming to visit us. And from this standpoint, it's, you can always invoke saying, oh, well, yeah, so maybe, maybe the species out there, you know, they, they don't want to interfere with our development because sort of, they watch an episode of, of Star Trek, right? <laughs> or, uh, or maybe yeah, that, you know, they, right, maybe, they don't have, maybe they're not curious about the cosmos or maybe, you know, but in order to explain why it is that we haven't seen any evidence of life we, you know, out there, we, we, you have to say that all of the, you know, all the species out there are following these rules. And I think that that starts, at least it strikes me as being implausible. But see, I don't think you have to say that because of the fact that we haven't really looked. I mean, to say even, you know, for an ast astrobiology is sort of a, a wonderful hot new thing in astronomy, right? But even among astrobiologists, to say that you look for intelligent life in the universe is still a pretty fringy thing to do. And we don't devote resources really to actually looking for life in the universe. To a certain extent, probably many people not to judge. You've watched the movie Contact. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched the movie Contact. So, you know, we have this image that, you know, we've been listening for radio signals and that we've really been searching for life in the universe, but actually um, we've been pretty resource poor in our ability to even do that kind of search. And furthermore, to look for radio leakage from um, planets that are technologically advanced, we've only been radio loud for a couple of decades and now we're getting quieter as our technology improves. And so, to a certain extent, it's not just that the, uh, you know, the entire universe is populated by hyper-intelligent space dolphins. <laughs> it's that you also have a case where, um, and this is what I meant by it's, it says more about us than about the universe probably at this point, is that we haven't really looked that much. And we don't actually signal in the way that we expect other civilizations to signal either. And so, to a certain extent, we're trying to make um, an inference about intelligent life in the universe that's based on something that we're not listening for and that we're not doing ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So um, all of us in this room, your traditional DARPA family, you're probably wondering, what in heaven's name are we doing with a panel like this? All right? I mean, it's, it's super cool to talk about. These are like amazing people. But why is DARPA looking at this? And I will tell you this, is that DARPA has a unique mandate. We need to go and think of things that others really don't. Where is the next surprise that will come our way? Where's the next surprise that we can generate? And you don't know unless you ask. And you won't find unless you explore. I mean, it's fundamentally what all of us in this room do. We're all scientists. We're all technologists in here. The world of biology is a young one relative, in a quantitative sense, to the, to the fields of uh, physics, mathematics, and chemistry. But biology, as you can see, is really a very rich discipline. And it is, in fact, I would argue, a place where surprise is waiting for us. So not to engage this community, not to think about the questions we talk about, in fact, is not in DARPA's best interest, not in the nation's best interest. And so if somebody's going to do it, let it be DARPA. Because after all, we are DARPA. 
<laughs> so I'm going to open it up to questions right now. Um, I understand that there's some questions from the app, but certainly uh, we're not limited to that. If any of you have a question and are not uh, shy, please put your hand up, and we have some folks in the audience that will come by with a, um, a microphone for you. So anybody have a question for the panel? Hello, I'm Amy Magnus, and I am not shy. <laughs> <laughs> so you're missing a person up there. You're missing a cognitive science person, right? Um, because one of the questions that we have is, you know, which came first, dreams or consciousness? So have we, you know, we, there's life that has world models and maybe has a uh, 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 motivation to practice while they're resting, but do you really have to become aware of that? So that's an interesting question for evolution. And the other thing that I think about too is the importance of the egg in intelligence life. Because I think one of the fundamental first abstract concepts that we come to while we're even in the womb is that there is an inside and there is a very rich outside. I love the book, Good Night Moon. It tackles that very question. A very simple book, which basically has two wor words, are and were. There is the tangible inside and the mystic outside. Comment, please. Ah, uh, thank you. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh <laughs> You know, I just get up every morning and I walk out the door and I go to my lab and turn my computer on. So I just, I, I really, beyond a lot of that is, is really tough. And I, and I mean, when you say that the, you know, that the, the, the tangible outside and, and everything, what, when you're, when you're trying to do an experiment or something else, you know, of course there's always going to be other explanations for it. Of course you can approach it from a totally different, different way. And uh, uh, we do have a cognitive scientist who we work with on one of our projects. And that uh, we get in big arguments about this of whether or not that, you know, we're actually doing the experiment just because it's the right way to do it or doing the experiment because it's just a product of the way in which our minds are working to be able to do it. There's a completely different other way to be able to do it. So. You know, actually, I think there is implications both to the beginning of the life and the end of the life. Is that, um, and there's, you know, end of life is actually going to be an increasingly big topic in the United States. Um, and one of the things that I think is, is that we've got to appreciate is that when we, one of our first realizations is that there is this really, you know, abstract realization is that there's this wonderful outside that we become increasingly and maybe overly curious about. And that our end of life, we rediscover the rich inside. And I think that if you can come to that, it, it, you know, we live our lives so that those last moments of life are incredibly rich. And respecting that is something that um, we can all learn to do. Thank you. No, thank you. Well, we have one question from the um, uh, online, then we'll come to this uh, gentleman at, uh, in a moment. And that is, uh, can life be more pervasive, spreading like a cloud over a planet? Lucianne? Well, I mean, certainly, the, to a certain extent, we don't know how life actually spread over this particular planet, only that we, we surmise it you know, wriggled out of some puddles <laughs> and spread from there. But did that happen at multiple points? Did it happen um, you know, simultaneously over the planet? I think that's an open question. And to a certain extent, uh, understanding how life spread across a given planet is, in, is one of the uh, primary motivations for finding life elsewhere in the universe, be it on Mars or be it on another planet, is to understand whether um, life is typically you know, pervasive uh, or whether it's typically isolated in pockets depending on its its um, origin, depending on the environment in which it lives in. And you know, to a certain extent, there is um, still this idea that it's possible for life to you know, have literally spread in a cloud in the sense that um, we do know that the planets of our own solar system have exchanged material. You know, at the, the Adler Planetarium, where I'm located, we have a piece of Mars. You can come and touch it and look at it. Um, it's literally a chip of Mars that lives here on Earth. And so we know that within solar systems, um, material is exchanged, and therefore it's possible, you know, particularly with some of the hardier forms of life, um, you know, these wonderful little animals, tardigrades, that can survive uh, in just about any possible condition, it is possible to um, bring life through space. And so, you know, did it spread uh, from body to body? Did it spread through the atmosphere? Did it spread um, from just a single point 
literally on the planet? We don't know. And that's one of the reasons we need to find out. <laughs> Uh, yes, just to also uh, qualify, I'm Mark Millis. I used to work for NASA running breakthrough propulsion physics and still look at the prospects of interstellar flight. And an interesting data point that we ran across is when you look at how much energy it would take to do interstellar flight, if that was accidentally applied to the Earth, I forget, was it vaporized 15 meters or 50 meters of the entire surface of the Earth? The short point is, is that um, a society would also have to become very responsible on how it deals with energy in order to do interstellar flight. And one other caveat on that, that was the minimum amount of energy, even if you had a magical rocket. Um, so I figure that needs to be part of the discussion too, that social responsibility is a prerequisite for dealing with those uh, energy levels. Um, and also, if anyone has any question about the interstellar flight, what's been thought of and stuff like that, I can definitely deal with that. Thank you. Jeff, you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I think that this, this basic point is contained in the great filter that it, the, the technological sophistication that a society would need in order to send, uh, uh, send a, a multi-generational spacecraft, for example, to a nearby star would mean that it, it, that civilization, if it did something wrong, could perhaps destroy itself. Right? So I think that th this idea that, well, that societies have to become more responsible as they become more powerful uh, well, that, that was in Spider-Man even, right? So I think that it's, um, yeah, so I totally agree. No, no. Um, we do have a question online, and that is, uh, and I'm going to give this to Mark, because it's right up his alley. What color were dinosaurs with their feathers? <laughs> uh, well, well, we don't know that much yet, but, but we're getting there. There's two ways that we analyze this. Is that, uh, one is that uh, there's melanosomes, which make up a lot of the color of feathers, as well as you know, body color uh, in living organisms. They're shaped differently. And if you do a survey of different melanosomes and then simply do a multivariate principal components analysis on it, you can create a predictive model that then if you find fossil melanosomes, then you can just do the same thing on that even though they don't have any color in them and then plug it in. So for that, what we've been able to determine is that in some of the, the very close relatives to living birds, things found in northern China, uh, at least one of them looked like a grackle. I mean, it was iridescent blue. And it was iridescent, not just because, because the melanosomes indicate that it was this bluish color, a blue-black color, but then because the melanosomes are lined in a, a, a linear array, so it works as a diffraction grading. So uh, we, could, we could tell that. Another technique that we're using, we had a paper just come out about uh, a, a parrot about 40 million years old from Wyoming, where that we were able to use uh, synchrotron radiation as a mass spec to look at uh, residues of chelated organometallics, and by looking at different oxidation states of titanium, of copper, of nickel, of all the other things that, are, that cause living bird feathers to be uh, the colors that they are, it, was, uh, it looked pretty much like a modern parrot. It was green and red, <laughs> so <laughs> the, the feathers, so not unsurprisingly, but, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but we're getting there. I mean, it's been the, the, the great hope now is on the synchrotron stuff because is that now that we have access to synchrotron time and we're actually able to detect these things at very, 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 very minute levels that uh, we're really learning a lot, you know, not just about what color they were, but, but other things about uh, their physiology and their diets as well. Wonderful. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the very fascinating panel. Uh, my name is Saad Ansari once again from OSDP. Um, two quick ideas and then a question. Um, so one is, I'm a big fan of red selling. So it'd be interesting to red sell why we haven't been contacted yet if you know, aliens do exist. So for example, um, maybe they'd only get to somebody or, or a civilization that signaled that they were quarantined. So if you visited, you wouldn't get diseased or something like that. Uh, another thing is we had this um, interfaces panel by DSO yesterday. And so it's also interesting to think about interfaces between sending signals and receiving signals. Um, maybe signals shouldn't work within space, but work within time, because even if we send a very strong signal, it won't really get very far in terms of space. And so what's the right interface for even how a signal could be sent? And my, my main question is, is um, so sometimes over the weekends, I pick a topic and I try to just binge into it. I had an extremophile bacteria binging weekend a few <laughs> months ago. Um, and you know, extremophile bacteria are very interesting for thinking about life on other planets. My, my question is, is um, uh, on Earth, you know, I, I think we've had extremophile bacteria um, pop up, you know, for a long time. Um, why haven't they evolved into more advanced forms? Or maybe they are advanced, but in a different way um, that we can't identify. And how, uh, 
how strong is the question of extreme of how bacteria correlated with questions of life on other planets? Mark. I think that extreme foul bacteria is extremely interesting for that. I mean, that's a whole division of uh, the DOE was working on it for, for several years, and it continues to be a very important thing. I mean, I think that it's, if we do find life on Mars, it'll certainly it'll be something like that. I think we can all pretty much agree to that, but, uh, uh, or the fossil record of that itself. But, you know, the, you know, it's studying not just extreme foul bacteria, but extreme foul fungi, extreme, and, and extreme fossil symbionts like lichens are really a good model system for us to be able to sort of predict what we might find in at least some of the places closer to our own planet where life may have occurred or still occur. So we do have an interesting question online I'm going to give to my friend Jeff here. Would finding life on Mars be a good thing or a bad thing and what would it mean in the next 10 years, and do you think it would lock down Mars as a type of nature preserve <laughs> and prevent eventual cloning of it? Uh, all right. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I think that I could answer this question uh, either as a scientist or as a human, right? Because uh, I think, I, you know. Is that different? Uh, <laughs> you know, apparently so, right? I, I, that I, intellectually, I think I'm convinced by Bostrom's argument that finding independently evolved life on Mars would bode ill for our future. And, you know, so as a, as a human, and you know, somebody who cares about you know, the future of my children and so forth, I, I have to say, and you know, I sort of believe, that, that this would be a bad thing if we found life on Mars. Of course, you know, I'm lying, because if, if, I, you know, if I pick up the newspaper and I read that we, just, we found life on Mars, I would be happy. You know, I, you know, and so I, you know, in that sense, I, I do have two very uh, conflicting views on this, on this subject. Uh, in term, and, and maybe uh, they, the question was probably not about cloning Mars. It was probably about terraforming Mars, maybe? Colonizing. 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 Okay, all right. All right. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, and there, I, I think it, it really, uh, it's definitely relevant, as far as I can tell, in that uh, we, you know, we're looking for life on Mars. And if after a legitimate search for life on Mars, I think that we would probably not feel so bad about going colonizing it and maybe, maybe even terraforming it, if that's okay to say. Uh, but, you know, but then if, if we did find life on Mars, then I think a reasonable argument could be made that it would be, that it would be wrong for us to terraform it. And that this is something that we'd have to, we'd have to argue about. But maybe, uh, maybe these guys have an opinion as well. Uh, yeah, Luzanne, they're going to come out of your chair. So. Um, yeah, no, I think actually the way that we should default to thinking about Mars is thinking about it as a nature preserve. I think that should be our fundamental starting place because it is our most reachable target for understanding the possible independent origin of life or the independent evolution of life. So if we, don't, if we find life there, um, I mean, there are lots of things that bode ill for the universe and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't stop me from getting up and doing <laughs> my job every day. So honestly, I don't care whether finding life on Mars is, is, it says anything about the great filter. I want to find life on Mars. Um, so you know, I think that the, the way that we should think about going to other planets is as a trade-off between how much we want to colonize and exploit those planets versus how much we want to actually understand what they have to tell us in the same way that we treat our own planet as a trade-off between those two things. Because we could actually, I mean, if we were to go to Mars and you know, terraform it, we lose the ability to answer the question of whether there is an independent origin of life. We lose the ability to understand whether life evolved independently and what the effects of those are. That's huge. Mars is still our most reachable place for understanding those questions in a way where we can actually go and physically look at samples to bring the, real, the full bear of our best laboratory techniques to, um, to answer those questions. And so if we irreparably alter the planet in some way that we don't understand the implications of, we, we miss our chance literally for our entire lifetimes. So I think that's a serious Thank thing you. to think about. Uh, Tim Cooper, strength engineer for Boeing uh, locally. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion regarding the great filter, but it strikes me as almost, in the, uh, it is inevitable that humanity will eventually collapse because all things do, even the universe will eventually end. Uh, goes back to Asimov's last question, right? So I guess, is there any, uh, has there been any discussion regarding the great filter rather than this one obvious thing, um, either berserkers or uh, something that just kills off life, or is it just a general aspect of how life works? 
Um, and what does that say about us that we think that, oh, if we discover this other species, right? This tells us something about our own species mortality and that strikes us full of fear. So there must be some existential threat out there of the very nature of the universe itself. Well, at least on Earth, we've had lots of occasions where we've seen really bad things happen. I mean, 65 million years ago, an asteroid hit off the coast of Yucatan, and that uh, you know, all the calculations of the energy that was dispersed basically made that the atmosphere glow for about six seconds afterwards, and that it you know, resulted in massive fires all over the world, massive extinctions, but not everything died. I mean, there's a lot of stuff still around. There's been several of these. I mean, that's the only one which we have real causality for. I mean, the, the Permo-Triassic boundary, over 96% of all the species on the planet became extinct. The mechanism for that, we don't know. But the one thing that, you know, replicating DNA seems to have in common, at least on this planet, is it's highly resilient. Stuff all through the great major extinctions that have happened, it's always come back. And the rebound not only has been fast, uh, it, at each time it's diversified into even more in different forms. So I think that there is just sort of a stochastic thing out there that you know, will happen every so often. It's just the luck of a draw in you know, living in a planetary system. I mean, the collisions are the most obvious one, but I know that you know, some of the people I work with uh, are interest, very interested in you know, gravitational pull, uh, as well as the, just the way planets are formed. Like our planet is, has you know, lots of tectonic action, lots of things that uh, influence life quite a bit, but not all planets have tectonics. So it's very different things, but you know, life is really resilient. And I, I think that you would be pretty hard pressed to go to a place uh, on another planet and uh, only find fossil life, to find everything on the entire planet totally exterminated. Now, it might have gone through something that's so bad that everything you've got left is just, you know, that uh, single cellular bacteria, but uh, it's still probably going to be there. So um, unfortunately, we're starting to run uh, short on time here, but I'm going to let uh, the good uh, Dr. Bernstein have the last question. Jeff, great panel. Thank you. I'm Kerry Bernstein. I'm a program manager at DARPA. So a rather generic question. Um, sound science and engineering has provided us with these tools that have allowed us to get an insight into the structure of the universe that we live in. And as those tools have improved largely and because of the people in this room, as the tools improved, the temporal and spatial understanding of that universe has grown. There have been a few people, uh, like Einstein, that got ahead of the technology and made predictions that only later on were fulfilled as the tools improved. I'm interested in the panelists' thoughts, not in physics, but in biology, as we continue to grow in our, in our tools and capability if there are biological underpinnings that help us understand where life should exist and, and how to look for it. Jeff? Sure. I, well, I, first, I may, maybe would just say that I think within science, there have been many examples of this uh, fruitful interplay between theoretical predictions and experimental measurements and back and forth. And of course, Einstein was f an extreme example of this, but, uh, but we'd like to believe that the everyday uh, practice of science has this aspect. Uh, but within, within biology, I mean, even Darwin uh, hypothesized from the information he had that, that humans likely uh, evolved or, you know, originally in Africa, you know, based on the, the diversity. Uh, he didn't know about DNA, so obviously it was not from uh, DNA diversity, but from uh, phenotypic diversity. He already hypothesized that. So that these are, this is an example from uh, deep insight making predictions that I think uh, ended up uh, being accurate. As far as life on other planets go, we certainly have this idea that it, it may be that water is essential, but again, we, we only know about life on our planet, so it's, I think uh, it's difficult to be confident in this conclusion. Lucianne. Yeah, you know, I think that um, one of the things that it would be really interesting to see pushed forward is the idea of um, what are the alternate metabolisms that are out there, what are the alternate materials that life can use and thrive? Because right now, we are very tuned towards looking for planets that are very similar to Earth, that have liquid water. Um, you know, we always uh, talk about looking for carbon-based life, and there are reasons that carbon-based life is probably the most common. Carbon is much more common than, for example, silicon and makes lots of bonds, but there's a lot of leeway, I think, in that to understand what kinds of life might be out there in a way that would be predictive and would allow to understand what other biosignatures we might be looking for. 
Right now, again, we look for the chemical imprint in planetary atmospheres of life that alters its atmosphere in the exact same way that Earth-based life does. But you know, the reason that the Earth has an oxygenic atmosphere is that long, long ago, there was life that altered it to be unha uninhabitable for lots of other kinds of life, cyanobacteria, which created the rise of oxygen. And so I think that pressing that frontier forward and understanding what other signatures might be out there, what else life is really capable of, um, is something that we could potentially do theoretically or perhaps even experimentally with um, the beginnings of synthetic biology that we haven't really done yet. So, so in our last minute, uh, we're just gonna ask our panelists each to give us, uh, leave us with their last big crazy frontier idea. So, Dr. Gore? Uh, well, from my standpoint, uh, the last 100, 200 years in human history have been a kind of a singular period, and that, uh, and it's lead, led us to take uh, for granted this idea that uh, we will always be, uh, that life will always be changing kind of dramatically from generation to generation. Uh, whereas if you look at what life was like for most of human history, uh, one generation led pretty much the same life as, uh, as the previous generation. And I think that this is relevant because it may be that there's simply a finite number of things for us to figure out in the world, a finite number of rules that govern natural phenomena. And that may mean that eventually things start to slow down. And this could even feed back to this discussion we had earlier today regarding the Fermi paradox and that perhaps it really is going to be the case that with the level of technology that we're able to develop, that maybe it's just not practical to get to neighboring uh, planets. And this could resolve the Fermi paradox, but may also lead to a bit of a depressing outcome where it may be that in a thousand years, we live in what I kind of think of as a dystopic utopia, where life is great, but it's the same great life that everybody, that you've been living for the last hundred years, and so it has a certain uh, stasis to it that is depressing. Lucien? <laughs> <laughs> On that cherry note? <laughs> well, I'd really like to, uh, us to get serious about looking for life in the universe. Um, you know, I think that even in the era with um, the James Webb Space Telescope where we'll have another handful of planets for which we have uh, some idea of what they're made up of, I think that we could be doing more to press, as I, as I said in response to the last question, the answers of what life is capable of, what alternative signatures might be out there, to really actively look for those signals of potential broadcasts from intelligent life. I think all of these, and to actually even consider signaling, although I think that that's something that we need to consider uh, very carefully before we go ahead and do it. Um, you know, I think that I would like to see us um, sort of, you know, put our action where our Fermi paradox is and <laughs> stop <laughs> expecting them to call when we're not really looking in the way that we could be. And Dr. Norell, you have the last word. Yeah, well, I think that, I mean, that really when we look at what progress is, and then progress not just as scientists, but progress in everything, it's really the meshing together of good ideas and technology. And that's how we discover things. And if you look at the notion of pro progress, I mean, it's something that, I don't know, this group that I, I work with, we've been talking quite a bit, it's rather a new thing. Uh, I think what most of us would consider to be progress really just dates back to the early 19th century and the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. Before that, people's lives and what they expected were going to be pretty much the same as their parents, their parents, parents, their parents, parents. You know, minor little improvements were made here and there, but not at the level and the speed that they're going on right now. I mean, could you imagine doing any of the work we do in this room 15 years ago at the level we're doing it now? I mean, it would just be inconceivable. So, the notion of progress, I think, is a very exciting one, and it, it helps us both understand you know, our own world, worlds which are out there, and I think that you know, progress will, will really allow us that if we convene this meeting 10 years from now, we'll be asking a whole different set of questions, and we'll have a whole different set of tools to be able to use, to be able to explore. Well, I think on that, that progress is coming, and this room is going to be the genesis of that progress. So thanks to the panelists, and thanks to you.